All right, we're going to get started. It looks like we have a full house here today. So I am Elise Smith Beck, I'm your 2018 Chamber President. I'm also Senior Vice President of Business Banking at Oregon Community Bank. And I want to say thank you to everybody for coming. I know we have an exciting topic today to cover. Um, some general uh, announcements I have is on May 7th, Pizza Pit is having their 25th anniversary celebration. There'll be a 4 p.m. ribbon cutting. So if you guys see this sheet, all this is on there. Um, our next member meeting is going to be May 16th, right here. And May 21st, one more last plug for our golf outing. If you guys haven't been a part of our golf outing before, it's a wonderful day. It's at, right here at the Legend of Oregon in Oregon, so not a far trip. And Judy is guaranteed wonderful weather. Right, Judy? I am, yes. All right, so no questions about that. On May 23rd, we're going to have the Omni Technologies ribbon cutting. They'll be, it'll, that will be at 2 p.m. with an open house of, from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. And you can get a tour of their new building. June 20th through the 23rd is Summerfest. Um, so if you haven't signed up for the parade, I, we would encourage you to do that. This year's theme is Wisconsin Pride. And we're hoping to have a special appearance from Buffy Manager. We'll see. <laughs> Um, and if you guys want to sponsor any of the activities going on for Summerfest, go over and see Tiffany and Judy. Volleyball, we've got some registration forms up there for our volleyball tournament that goes on during Summerfest, which is also a fun time. Our run is now open. There's a 5K, 10K, and 10 mile option this year. Uh, last year, uh, we did have to cancel our 10 mile route because of the rotary trail, trail being underwater. So this year, we've just rerouted it. It's going to be a two-loop route for the 10-mile run. So still getting that 10-mile run in. Should be fun. And we're always looking for volunteers for Summerfest. So Tiffany and Judy can help you with that as well. So with that, I'm going to go around the room. If you could stand up, tell us your name, who you're with, and if there's anything about your business that you'd like to share, <coughs> now is the time to do it. We've got a lot of business owners in here. So. Um, we're going to start here and then go kind of that way. <laughs> go ahead, Dan. Um, Diane Slider, I'm representing the Oregon Area Food Pantry. And exciting this month is when we expanded our hours. We're now open every Tuesday from 9 to 11, and the second and the last Thursday from 4 to 7. And we keep growing, and everything is just moving along at the pantry. Hi, I'm Scott Meyer. I'm here in a number of capacities, but today I'm here with the Oregon uh, Housing Coalition that's presenting a uh, program for us, and also with Genesis Housing here in Oregon, uh, which has been providing affordable housing on a nonprofit community owned basis for 48 years right here in Oregon. Go. Jack Medina of Corporate Business Systems. Uh, we handle office technology, printers, copiers. Uh, Everybody's got a print paper for their different businesses, and we help you manage that in better ways. Eric Nadler, King Financial Group, uh, do financial planning, both for small business and uh, individuals, uh, retirement planning, all that kind of thing. Hello, I'm Jim Murphy with New Inch Wonder Asset Management. Um, set 401k plans for small and large businesses. So I'm certain lots of you guys are done filing your taxes, hopefully. Um, if you don't have a 401k plan, it's a great way to defer income, so you have to pay that tax now. Um, it's a, certainly a nice way to provide a benefit to your employees, too. So let me know if you can help you out with that. And past chamber president. Yeah, and past yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Anna Petrie. I'm the team manager with the Pure Integrity Homes team. Um, we are working on a hygiene drive that will be um, supporting the porch light. Uh, organization in Madison and they work to end homelessness in the Dade County areas. And um, in at Summerfest we'll also be doing a carnival tournament. It's going to be double double elimination, 16 teams. So keep you know obviously it is built for work Thank you. Jeff Minter with Realty Executives Super Strength. <coughs> Uh, Pastor Jeff Hendricks, I'm with Faith Lutheran Church uh, here in Oregon. Uh, it's Holy Week, so it's a busy week for, for me. It's always the busiest week for us, um, but I'm glad to, to take some time off and, and be here. Um, 
Normally, I, uh, I'm always stressed, but I plan enough uh, in advance to, to be able to join you today. So, uh, Craig Close, LSM Chiropractic. I also serve on the board um, at the chamber here. Brian Gars with State Farm here in town. Uh, we took another rate increase, and also that last time, and then since then, we took another one. So, pretty competitive on the auto insurance side. Good afternoon, Greg Graham from the Orion School District. Um, we will be doing our senior seminar capstone discussion things again on June 5th in the morning. So look for an email coming out. It'll be in the chamber alert as well. Look for volunteers to come speak with our seniors and just have a conversation. They'll tell you where they're going, why they're doing that, how they think they're ready. And you just sit, listen, and ask some questions. So look for that coming out soon. Historical society, so if you want to know where your pam pam or where your neighbor came from, mm -hmm. well, then you try to help you. You're lost. <laughs> Craig Eggers with Old National Bank. This is my first uh, meeting with you folks, so nice to see you meet all of you. If you're looking to build or buy a home in the near future or later, feel free to come on down to Old National Bank and we can talk. Thank you. Danielle Piper, Relationship Banker at Old National Bank. Um, if you buy your home from, or get a mortgage from Craig, we have our great new black special still going on. I'm Jeannie Carpenter. Um, uh, my husband Uriah and I own Firefly Coffee House and Arts and Cheese. And um, on Tuesday night, I was sworn in as the Village President. So, <laughs> so now you get to all complaints apparently now come to me. <laughs> That's at 6 o'clock next Tuesday. And then I uh, also want to just give an update. We uh, volunteered at the Oregon Food Pantry uh, for an entire morning uh, earlier this week, and we raised over 1,000 pounds of food uh, for the Oregon Food Pantry. So that's exciting. Oh, the, the credit seminar is at our Alpine office. Yep. Great. So. Good afternoon, Paula Harms from the Sleeping Suites next uh -huh. door. Um, thank you for everyone who showed up for our ribbon cutting earlier this month. We had over 200 uh, individuals come through the hotel and experience the hotel, so thank you, Judy and Lise, for everyone who came up for uh, ribbon cutting. Uh, we just picked up a 14-passenger shuttle, and we've seen when you pulled in this morning, so that's brand new. We're ready to uh, start making runs to local establishments throughout town. And uh, if you need last-minute reservations for Easter, if you have the in-laws coming in and you don't want them staying with you, we still have rooms available. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a call. Thank you. Christine Sperry, UBNT Financial Services in the Law Department. Um, the, most of you guys know we're merging with State Bank Across Plains, and all of that's been approved, so it does look like our, our date is still May 31st that we will be officially merging. So exciting things happening there. Okay. 
I'm Carly McWilliams, support on Community and I wanted to share this week is um, National Teen Children to Save. So some of our colleagues at Oregon Community Bank have been going to the local schools and teaching classes on teaching to save, children to save. So if you have any children in the area, they might be coming home with some piggy banks or some dollar coins, so look up for that. And if they want to open up a savings account, send them to OCB. Ben Laddick, Hanson Electronics, U.S. Cellular. Uh, we've got a pretty good U.S. Cellular promotion going on right now. We have uh, two lines that are eligible, an upgrade to a Samsung, uh, one of the newer tens, uh, $400 website TV credit for Samsung's website towards a TV. We also do uh, computer and IT services, uh, break fix, so if you break it, malware viruses, bring it on in, you can check it in and get you back up and running. We also do security and surveillance systems. Thank you. Dr. Mark McCann, LSM Guard Project. I'm Jennifer Way with the Oregon Public Library. Um, we just recently hired an architect. We're planning for a new Oregon library, which is really exciting. Um, it's going to go on Main Street across from Netherwood Bowl. So I'd welcome any feedback you have about what you'd like to see in the library or how you'd like it to, to fit with the downtown. So, thank you. Eric Fenton with Hans Electronics, Oregon. I gotta stop inviting Ben because he takes all my thunder. Uh, <laughs> the only other thing is we have some great switcher offers right now for iPhone users. Uh, they have an iPhone XR free uh, with certain requirements. Uh, and they also have a switcher promo for 450 off if you don't need those set requirements. So. We also do cell phone and iPad repair too, so if you drop the phone and break your screen, fix that. Casey Koenig, I'm with the Oregon Community Bank. Uh, just want to say on Fridays we have family cookies and popcorn, and I think you'll need some homemade baking them tomorrow, so it should be extra good. <laughs> so come on in. Homemade. Homemade. Uh, Joe Bull, the Peer Technic Homes team, and Remax Commercial. Um, it's hard to compete with cookies and popcorn, but um, for our uh, personal hygiene drive, we have little. Um, Mini sizes, mini sizes, the small little uh, travel. travel sizes, that's what I mean. <laughs> Those are the best for porch light, that's what they let us know. Um, and I want to highlight Greg, what he said about the capstone. Um, I've done it a couple times and going into it thinking that it was going to be a really cool thing for the kids and, you know, talking about talking to the seniors about their stuff. It was really cool for me to reflect on my education and my experience. And I, uh, I really want to go every time. So none of you go, so I can keep going and have a spot. <laughs> if, if you're free, it's awesome for the seniors. And it was really neat to uh, uh, reflect on my experience, my education. I'd be third on that. I've also participated. It's a lot of fun. So, anyways, without further ado, I think we're going to have some people come up. Uh, Karen and Rob and Scott, come up and tell us about affordable housing in Oregon. They'll uh, briefly introduce themselves and then tell us all there is to know. So thanks, guys. And I'll have to piggyback. I'll have to piggyback on the uh, senior capstone projects. I also did that and got a lot out of it myself. So that was really fun. Um, so yes, as Elise uh, introduced us, I'm Karen Victorson. And this is Rob Dick. We're from the Oregon Housing Coalition. Thank you so much, Judy, for your invitation to come and join you and tell you more about who we are and why we're here. Um, so we're just going to start out with a basic introduction of who we are, why, why we are here. And then we'll go into what the Housing Coalition is about. Um, we'll talk about what the housing problem looks like in Dane County and in Oregon, as well as some examples of what affordable housing workforce housing looks like and then close with um, a video um, about some just uh, historic preservation project that um, just some other ideas of what communities are doing to address the housing issue. So um, I have, I'm a resident of Oregon for 15 years. My husband and I have three children. We moved here to plant a church called Community of Life. And um, we also, I became really interested in housing based on my volunteer work with our church as well as in our schools. Um, I started Friends of Oregon School District with some friends, and through that interaction with staff and with family, I was realizing that housing was probably the root, or is the root issue of so many of the basic need issues that our community has, as well as other communities in Oregon. And so, 
through some conversations with Rob and some other people, we formed a coalition called the Oregon Housing Coalition to move this issue. Hello, I'm Rob Dick. I'm the Executive Director of the Dane County Housing Authority. So we are the public housing authority for Dane County where there isn't a, a local municipal housing authority. So that means Stoughton, DeForest, and the City of Madison who have their own housing authorities. Uh, basically, we operate uh, the public housing program, also the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program, and then are working to uh, develop and rehabilitate new um, affordable housing so that people can afford not only their housing, but also their basic needs, as we find that when, when families are paying too much for housing, other things suffer, whether that's medical care, prescription drugs, um, clothing, or school supplies for kids. So that's really what we're driving at. I am uh, an Oregon resident, and I did graduate from Oregon High School, so I'm very excited to be able to do this in my hometown. Um, and Oregon is so much more friendly than all the other municipalities that I go to. So um, we're really excited to, to do this. We're kind of wrapping up sort of our barnstorming education phase of this and really now hoping to actually bring some of these projects into reality and, and really impact the community. So we're very excited. So the Oregon Housing Coalition was formed about a year ago, um, and we're all residents of Oregon. Um, it's kind of an informal group. Um, we all just share the same concern that housing costs are too high, and there are Oregon residents who are being left behind um, because of the housing costs that are um, too high. And so we're like, we just need to do something about it. So I have absolutely no experience in housing, so people like Rob are really helpful um, in helping us collect data. So that was a lot of our foundation as we need to we need to educate ourselves about what the problem is specifically in Oregon, and then we also need to partner with businesses, churches, individuals in our community to address this issue. It's not just a, a simple issue that you know one organization or person can solve. We need to really be creative and partner with other people. So we're going to start out with a video that hopefully will work. <laughs> um, and this video is just going to give you a basic um, idea of housing and who it affects. There's just not enough to go around. And they have waiting lists, very long waiting lists. You just can't afford anything more expensive, so where do you go? So the housing gap is the difference between the amount of income that people earn and therefore the house that they could afford and the number of units that are available at that price point. Well, I lived in Middleton first, and that wasn't low income, so that's why I moved. If I was living back where I used to, it would be three-fourths of my Social Security would be for housing. And I wouldn't have enough for food and and uh, phone or electric. And it's not like the elderly people that are looking for a home haven't worked through their lives. They're not freeloaders. They have worked and they just don't have the money now to provide their living. And just look around. When you go to the store or you go out somewhere, look around and see how many elderly there are. It's growing fast and we gotta get ahead of it. Most low-income households are working households and they don't earn enough to have a decent quality place to live where they can raise their family and in a safe and stable neighborhood. So we've been together 11 years. I work for Jersey Mike Subs in Middleton. I'm an assistant manager. And I work at American Girl in Middleton. I've been there three years. We've noticed in the last 20 years that in many places across the country, housing costs have gone up much faster than people's incomes. And that puts pressure on uh, their ability to spend money for other things. It took us a long time to find some place that was affordable, that was nice. We didn't have a car before we moved here. I mean, we everything we did was by cab, by walking, or, you know, trying to get rides from people. The apartment that we're living in is good, it's affordable. Um, we're able to save a lot of money staying here because they take care of the property. We want to be here. It saved us a lot of money where we were able to afford daycare for our son. Whoa, did you like that? We were able to afford 
food, believe it or not, food's expensive. So we're able to keep food in the refrigerator. We're able to go to go to work. Here it gives us reassurance that we're, we're good, we're safe, we feel like a family. We're really talking not just about making uh, stable housing for families, but it helps to strengthen neighborhoods and strengthen our schools and stabilize our employment base. Having employees that can live closer in to the plant is a big benefit to us. We know there's a gap in the community for affordable housing, so we're working on uh, projects uh, in conjunction with businesses and the city of Sun Prairie to provide affordable workforce housing. So workforce housing is really housing that is priced to meet the needs of the workforce that you have in an area. Tight labor market kind of forces us as a company to look outside of our general area and uh, it's difficult to recruit employees to want to come to work here at our plant and have to have a 40 to 45 minute to an hour commute. I believe if workforce housing is not available, it increases the turnover rate. For many households who live far away from work, they may feel like they're saving money on their housing, but they're really spending a lot of time and money on gas and on travel. And it means that if their car breaks down, either they have to pay for their car or pay for their rent. So they might lose their job or they might lose their housing. When we have developers building new apartments that are affordable, it creates construction jobs, it creates additional jobs as people spend their money in the community. The City of Middleton had a workforce housing committee that said we want 295 units of affordable housing over a certain time period. Having that roadmap is key for developers to know what the communities want so that they can bring the projects forward that the community is already asking for. I think the economic impact is huge. You know, we took a vacant bowling alley on two acres and built a $16 million project. The city recognizes this increase in taxes while at the same time providing units at this huge range of affordability. Meadow Ridge Middleton has uh, 76 out of 95 units that are affordable, uh, ranging in income levels from 30% to 60% of the area median income. You know, we've got units targeted for veterans, we've got units targeted for people that have disabilities and require supportive services. So, you know, these projects really throw a wide, diverse net for a tenant base, which really creates, I think, personally, a better apartment community. You don't look at this building and say, hey, that's gotta be an affordable housing project. I mean, this is as nice as any market rate housing project. To fix the housing gap, we need a sustained partnership across all sectors. So for employers, that can mean helping their employees to find housing. For cities, it can mean spending money or helping to approve more uh, apartment construction or development of affordable housing. And really, for the banking and financial sector, it means financing and funding these projects. <laughs> and this is the best apartment that we've had. It's like our own private little community where you're getting to know your neighbors so you can actually look out for your neighbors too. I have a sign that says everyone needs a little place to call home. And I think it's so true. We don't ask for a mansion. We just ask for a little place to live. Share because he's our numbers guy. 
he's going to share a little bit more specifics about what the housing situation is in Oregon. Okay, if my high school math teachers knew I was the number guy, they would probably <laughs> cry. Um, so this is just some general information that we have about Oregon, and I can go through some of this with you. Our median income is 76480 Median, uh, obviously you guys know that means it's the middle. So there's a lot of people above that, there's a lot of people below that. And so what we're talking about is trying to create housing that is affordable at all income levels. Um, the average cost of a home in Oregon is $226,009. I bet you Jeff would tell us that's low. Yeah. Um, there's, I, I know we looked uh, last year at all available homes on the MLS, and I believe there were three in Oregon that were below 300, 300 to $350,000, and they were all about that big. Um, the average uh, starting salary for some of our largest employees, we did, or employers, we did a, a little survey where we contacted some of our local employers. Our biggest employer is the school district, and the average uh, starting salary for a teacher is 44,000. Manufacturing and warehouse ranging from about 286 to 35,000, and then customer service, 47,000. Um, what it really means is when we looked at this, the average uh, school teacher on a single income can't afford a home in Oregon. The average uh, manufacturing or administrative worker can't afford the average rent in Oregon. Um, so when we talk about affordable, what that really means, and this is the HUD definition, is that you're not paying more than 30% of your total income on rent plus utilities. So if you're paying more than that, it's what we call cost burden. If you're paying more than 40%, it's what we call extremely cost burden. So, um, so here in Oregon, you would need to make $37,320 a year or $17.94 an hour to afford the average apartment. And to afford the average home, you need to make $70,720 a year or $34,000. So as you say, um, on, on those incomes that we have, those starting incomes, it's very difficult. Um, of our residents, 47% of our residents that are cost burden, that are paying more than 30% of their income, are seniors. Um, in fact, in Oregon, we, we have some affordable housing for seniors. We actually don't have any true affordable housing for families. But even that statistic tells you what we have, we don't have anywhere near enough. 8% uh, of the residents are paying more than 70% of their income on housing. That's unsustainable. Um, 18% of students in the Oregon School District qualify for free or reduced lunches. That's a scary statistic. Um, and only 13% of employees working in those businesses that we surveyed said their employees live in the village. A lot of times they're living in Evansville, Edgerton, some of those more outlying communities and community in because the housing is affordable. <coughs> So why should we care? Um, I live in this community. I've lived here for 15 years. I've enjoyed the benefits of living in Oregon. Biking to school. My kids have been able to bike to school. Um, my husband works in Madison. We have a car that, that we can afford and he can commute back and forth. And we just enjoy this small community so much. And we want all residents of Oregon to be able to thrive and live in this community for a long period of time. Um, so reasons why we should care, you guys can see. So it's good for the environment. When people live near their jobs, they're more likely to walk or bike. Um, it's good for the social structure of a community, especially a small community. Um, when communities offer a variety of housing options for people at all income levels, you'll find that people are way more invested in their community. They can stay, they can live there, they can play there. Um, and they're, they're just way more invested. And it's also good for the economy and local businesses that have access to a larger workforce, um, they'll find that they're more successful at retaining their employees. <coughs> so this quote is something that I thought was just a really great summary of why we should care. When there's a lack of supply of housing that workers can afford, they live further away from work or spend more than half of their income on housing. For employers, this can make attracting and retaining a workforce more difficult, and for workers, this can mean not having adequate time or money to spend on necessities like education, health care, food, transportation, or daycare. So, 
from here we're just going to talk to you a little bit about, so what are we going to do about it? <laughs> it's a huge undertaking to talk about housing and to think about how can we solve this problem. And it, it requires partnerships, as I said before. So um, over the past year, our Housing Coalition has come up with some goals based on, we looked at Fitchburg's comprehensive plan as well as Middleton's, Sun Prairie. There's a lot of communities that are addressing this issue. We're not unique in this. We're just, we want to do something as well. So our goals are, we want to create 200 housing units that are affordable for our lowest income residents. So those, are, those residents are the ones that are making 0 to 30% of the area median income. A lot of those residents are most vulnerable. They're seniors, they're families, they're um, those with disabilities. Um, and we can do that by rehabbing existing rental properties and also developing new rental properties. The other thing that we want to address is working with developers and builders to create mixed income neighborhoods, neighborhoods that have a variety of housing at all income levels so that um, people that work here um, can live here too. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, what affordable housing is and what we have. So there's basically two ways that affordable housing can exist, what we like to call naturally occurring affordable housing. And a lot of time that just means old housing that becomes cheap and that you can afford, or housing that is specifically designed and built to be affordable. Um, here in Oregon, we have a few different examples. The Genesis housing, um, which is uh, USDA Rural Development Finance, uh, 56 units for seniors and the disabled. Um, for the vast majority of these units, there's what's called a rental assistance uh, contract, where um, USDA is making sure that for the tenants in those units, that they're only paying 30% of their income in rent. So if you have a senior who's making $1,000 a month in Social Security, they're only paying $300 a month to live there for rent plus utilities. And USDA is reimbursing Genesis the balance to make, to make um, uh, up the operations of the project. Um, so that is really our only true subsidized housing in Oregon that guarantees that people aren't paying more than 30% of their other income. It's great, it's not enough. We saw the slide on, on seniors that um, was 47% of our cost burden are seniors. So we need to do better on that. How many units did you say you have 56? 56. And how, how many, Scott, with the rental assistance again? 38 units of rental. 38 of the 56. So, um, for for a village of, uh, are we over how many? 10,000 10, now? Yeah, okay. Um, the other type of affordable housing that we have in Oregon is what's called either Section 42 or the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. If we were on the other side of the building, we could see this project because it is right across the street. And I bet most of you don't know that it's affordable housing. But this was built with the uh, Low Income Housing Tax Credits. Um, and basically what it is, is instead of subsidizing the rent the way uh, USDA does at Genesis, the IRS subsidized the construction of this building. Okay? So the developer got tax credits so that their debt is lower and so that their operating expenses are lower. And they agree in exchange to set aside a certain number of units for people at certain income levels. Those are going to be typically 30, 50, and 60% of county median income. And then there are rents that are set to be affordable at 30, 50, and 60% of county median income. The only problem here is if the only unit is available is a 60% unit, and you are at 40% of county median income, the rent doesn't scale like it does with true rental assistance. So you're still paying more than you can afford. It's better than nothing, but it's, um, it, it, it's not always truly affordable. Um, and just to, to talk a little bit more about Oregon, so there's actually two tax credit projects right across the street, total of about 48 units for seniors. We've got the Genesis project for seniors. We really don't have anything for family. So we've got a, a long way to work there. Um, this is just some examples of what affordable housing can look like. People have a lot of opinions and preconceived notions about what is an affordable housing, what an affordable housing project looks like. A lot of times that's a negative interpretation. But current affordable housing, it blends in. I mean, again, I, th I think a lot of people don't even notice that that, that, that is an affordable project. This is uh, Cannery Row Apartments in Sun Prairie. It was also built with the low-income housing tax credits. Mixed-use, commercial on the first floor, and then residential. Um, 
We also want to look, this isn't just about rental. Rental is important, but we also want to look at affordable home ownership. And we want to look at developing neighborhoods for mixed income. We want to be able to have home ownership options at all income levels. That's very important. And we want to make sure we have integrated communities so that you know, uh, we have people of all income levels intermixing. We don't have all the affordable on this side of town and all of the super expensive on that side of town because that doesn't create a balanced community. So these are some examples of, of an integrated community with affordable home ownership. And there's lots of different ways to tackle that. Tax credits is, is one option. And then this is a, a Grandview Commons, which has a mix of uh, affordable rentals and affordable condominiums. So other options for home ownership. One project I really wanted to talk about, this is called the McHenry Apartments, and it's in Sun Prairie. And the reason I really like this project, the Housing Authority issued a $10 million tax exempt bond for the construction of this project, so I like that. But also, what happened is um, the family that owns Home and Lindsay Paint in Sun Prairie saw that they had a problem with having affordable housing for their employees in Sun Prairie. And they were, a lot of employees were coming from Madison, the east side of Madison, where they could afford to live. And they said, that's a problem, because again, car breaks down, snow, apparently it snows here. Um, people can't get to work. So what they said is, we're gonna do, we're gonna fix this. So, so the family that owns Home Lindsay actually spearheaded this project with forward development and invested in the tax credits to help get this thing built. And I really love that example because that's a local business saying, we've got a problem and we can be the solution. And they're also saving a ton of money on federal income taxes by, by, um, by investing in this project. So it's 72 units with two commercial spaces, um, 37 of the 74, or sorry, 74 units, 37 of those are what they call workforce housing. So again, they're set aside for people at 50% uh, or 60% of county median income. And we're talking about spacious, brand new construction with one bedroom starting at 878. Are there any one bedrooms in Oregon for 878? Yeah, right, exactly. So, um, this, and again, financed with the 4% low income housing tax credit program and, and DCHA tax exempt bonds. So we can get very creative on putting together different financial structures, tax credits, low interest loans. There's lots of ways to do this, but um, I really like that, that this is a community. At Sun Prairie, I got a call from the mayor of Sun Prairie last year, and he said, we need to have a meeting because we gotta figure out how to build housing for single mothers with either uh, mental health or substance abuse issues. I said, are you kidding? <laughs> That's great. So the city of Sun Prairie really understands that this is so important. And not only from their elected officials to their businesses to the community, all work together to get this done. So. I'm calling an audible here. Um, instead of doing another video, <laughs> I, um, I, this is a great example. Wausau is another small community that is addressing the affordable housing issue by looking at historic um, preservation kind of projects. And um, this video is, is another example of um, how they um, took a, um, a building that was a historic building and Put it, put affordable housing in there. It's just a beautiful building, and and the residents there are um, just so in awe and appreciative of the fact that they can live in a historic building that they can afford, and they really feel um, connected to the community in a different way. So I just thought that instead of watching another video, I think sometimes questions are a little bit more fun because especially this is such a big topic around Dane County. If you're as employers, I'm sure you have employees that you may know that are struggling with with these kinds of issues and you know we would love your feedback as well what you're seeing and experiencing um, and just before we have the questions just to let you know um, how you can help us is that we are looking for more um, business involvement and more banking financial institution involvement so if you have interest in this if you want to just show up to a meeting like i said we're really informal i yeah we don't have officers or anything like that we we meet about once a month and um, it's just a way for us to all gather together and talk about what, what we can be doing. Um, our next, you know, after we're doing this education advocating um, 
portion of this. You know, we did the data collection, now we're doing education and communication. Now we really want to get, like Rob said, now it's time to act. Now it's time to really work on the projects. And we've got Gorman and company that's in our town that we want to partner with. They're, they've done things all over the country. Um, we've got a lot of great partnerships and people that are involved with the coalition that are giving us some great ideas and feedback. So we're really excited about what we can be doing, but we really would like to have some more involvement from the business community and some more feedback from you guys. So now we'll just open up to questions and, and comments for you. So should we pass this around or you can all hear it? Any questions? How do we know when the meeting is? Great question. I email you. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're interested, just come in to me after um, after we're all done here and I'll write down your name and, and your email address and I'll include you in it. Are there any planned projects coming up that are in the works?
and he has issued sort of an update uh, of that. And it's all based on census data. So the really great thing about, about that report is it looks at every community in Dane County and says this is how many people you have at 30%, this is how many people you have at 50% of median income, and this is how many units are affordable, right? So you can really kind of get this snapshot. Um, so our, our original, off the original report, that's where we came up with the, with the 200 units. The, the update, things changed a little bit, so now we're really focusing on those, um, those households that are extremely cost burdened. Um, and so I think the 200 correlates to the extremely cost burdened um, renter households in that report. So, so as Carmen said, it would sort of address the, the most drastic um, Sort of, sort of sector of that, um, but I would say if you, I'm not really sure how to put a number on to say if everyone in the village was in housing that they could afford, how many units that would be, but it would probably be more like 500. That's, that's I think, good year. Right? I, I think, I mean, one of the things, I think it's tough for a lot of people to really understand that, you know, how much the need is, right? Because And that's why I think mixed income neighborhoods allowing for people to, like your first year single teacher who wants to move to Oregon, um, can live in that apartment, that teacher gets married or has a partner, they can move into that starter home. We don't have an inventory of starter homes in Oregon right now. So we need to work with developers and make connections with developers. Our village board needs to really be on top of that to work with developers who are interested in making sure that there's a mixed income and not just one type of house that's in each neighborhood to help address some of that need. And as we know from our from our uh, visits to the food pantry, what did we say, a thousand, a thousand families in, in December and January? No, it was 160. Oh, I'm sorry. But it's close to the number. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, I know why I did that math because I was trying to do. I was trying to think of how many, what percentage of the village that is, right? And so if there's ten thousand, um, ten thousand residents, that probably means there's somewhere around, you know, how I many houses? Thirty-five hundred households. Is that what's in the Pulse report? I think so. Okay. This is the yeah. This is the whole Oregon school. Sure. Right. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. But to think that there's yeah. you know that there's over 100 families that that are, are food insecure and using the, the food pantry. Oregon does a really good job of hiding its its lower income and, and distressed families because we don't see them on the streets. But that doesn't mean that it's not here. And with the number from the students receiving free reduced, reduced lunches, these are all indicators of an economic problem. And this is part of the solution. I would say that um, on the village board right now, we have a majority of folks on the board that are um, ready and willing to move forward with something like this. We just need, we need direction. Like, what do you want us to do? Should we be reaching out? Are you guys going to work with us? So make sure that you are communicating with the village board because we have a majority right now that's going to go to do something like this. That's great. So, that's great. And you know, we did do a, a presentation to the uh, Village Plan Commission to sort of do some of this, sort of, sort of same introductory, show the video, talk about who we are and what we want to do. And I think that that's, that, that's you know, sort of that next step. And I joke about it, but really having a village board that says we understand that this is a problem and we want to do something about it is incredible because that is not the norm. And a lot of times it's, I'm sorry, but um, we don't need that here. So I, I, I am very happy that that's the reception. And another real positive that our community has done is that um, we consulted with Olivia Perry from Dane County Housing Init Initiative. She came and presented to us and said, hey, here's what you guys need to do as a community to make yourselves, um, uh, to make your community attractive to developers and to people who want to come here and do projects like this. And one of them is to have an affordable housing fund in our community, our village board, um, and I don't don't know exactly how that all works, but I think it's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah we have one. We have one. Yeah, uh, four hundred forty thousand dollars right now. So we, we closed out the TIF district. Yeah. Um, we looked at open an extra year, and then all of the TIF uh, funds 
all of the increment that was gained throughout that year then went to affordable housing fund. So we have a fund started. Yeah. Uh, we just need some direction and yeah. tell, us, tell us how to do it. Any other questions? Otherwise, thank you, Karen. Thank you. Yeah. Did anybody have a happy Easter? If you guys are interested in knowing more, you can come on up and I'll write down your name.